So your grandfather is Italian, old Italian man. Uh-huh. Why? He has a clock on his, near his bed. Yes. It's never been set to the right time. Well, how far is it set in advance? It depends on the day. It's, it's always different? It's never right, yeah. That's it's bizarre. It's off by two hours. Sometimes it's <laughs> off by 20 minutes. Usually 20 minutes is, is to get it to get ahead. Sure, but it's not. Sometimes it'll say, like right now it's 2.45. It, the clock will just say 8.30. But I was just looking at the clock and I was like, that's never right. And then he got a new clock because it used to be a small little old one with the red digital numbers. And now right it was either. blue. And I was like, wait, why isn't it right yet? Yeah. And then that's why no one was always confused. <laughs> My, he, he, he did say good morning to me when I walked in at 1.30. Good morning, Michael. Oh, my God. What is up, watch fam? I am Christian, the curator of the Theo and Harris Vintage Watch Shop. My name is Michael, and this video is sponsored by Squarespace. You need a website or domain, we'll tell you more about it later. Terrific. Um, today we're gonna be revisiting some of the watches from Watches and Wonders, so some of the new releases of 2023. We've got three mini conversations here that are really, really fascinating, yep. um, and for different reasons, right? Um, the first is is Bulgari and their Octo Roma collection. Got Guy the Finissimo. No. Yes. Guys, this is going to be a Hold great on. conversation about just an underdog brand that just is blowing my mind as a watch lover. Yeah. Um, phenomenal stuff. Full conversation to come. The second is Piaget. And that's going to be a, another fascinating conversation about um, the future of a brand that was once very, very profitable and is again finding their way. Oh. Dude, Wild. Really? And then the third is Cartier. And Cartier prints money. Usually when brands print money, they don't particularly need to produce the best product because their brand yeah, equity in the world. Goes, right. Cartier does some things that are just unbelievable from a watchmaking perspective, yep. um, particularly in the skeleton world that are just like, it, I hate to say like beyond my wildest imagination, but yeah. it is truly like, I cannot believe you just did that. Well, well, here's a question that we'll answer later, but is it innovative or is it... Referencing, um, this particular one, it's just it's innovative. It's just, um, it's exp it, it's like redefining. You're like, the boundary. You acid. <laughs> it's it, open the third eye. It's reimagining like the boundaries of one's possibility creatively. Wow. Um, so we got a long conversation ahead. The world of watches in 2023. What's going on? This is this industry is getting really good Ooh. because the brands know that the clients are becoming more and more discerning by the minute. Mm. Which is a, which is a bad thing but also a really good thing because they're going to they're going to appreciate true beauty. That chunky unpolished watch with our name on it doesn't sell anymore because now people are like, well that's chunky and not polished. Well, exactly. Wow. Exactly. So there's so much to talk about. So Bulgari, uh, w when Bulgari introduced the Octo Finissimo, yes. it was maybe misunderstood, maybe not given the praise that it deserved, sure. but by watch enthusiast standards, it was a massive hit. Yes. Okay, sure. Right. Yeah. So it was probably, and this was not a Genta design, mm -hmm. okay, right. but it was probably the most brilliant Genta grandchild. What do I mean when I say that? I mean industrial design and luxury and thin and, and all that stuff. Like this is juxtaposition, yeah, yeah. right? It's definitely yep. a grandchild of Genta, um, but um, but it was by Bulgari and it was completely original. Right. We have gone so far to, so far as to say that the Octo Finissimo is a higher achievement is a greater achievement than most Royal Oaks today because they're so unoriginal of course and of they're course. great watches but they're just basically re a Royal Oak is a Royal Oak and then a lot of other brands that want to get near the Royal Oak end up making an alternative to the Royal Oak not mm. a different watch right. right and this was a completely different watch exactly and and uh, again affordable is an odd term but right. uh, app uh, approachably priced uh, you know I think around like twelve thousand dollars you can get them in the eleven thousand dollar range uh, a couple of different variations in finishing, uh, the materials, hundred percent thinness, record setting, and that's where they went next. Uh -huh. They went to like hyper complication, tourbillon, crazy stuff, um, and they began this competition with Piaget. Yeah, who's going to go thinner? Who's going to go thinner? Ultimately, Richard Mille ended up taking the cake, yeah, but that was, was that? an ugly they watch. Were, they weren't even invited to the cookout, and all of a sudden they're there. With, oh, yeah. And the folks at, at, at Piaget, actually, and we'll get into that later, were like, well, we don't consider that 
actually like really? we don't consider it a watch oh. you know so we'll get into that later but wow. but but bulgari uh, had this massive home run with the octo finissimo it never got long in the tooth like it never got old they kept doing it justice in, in different variations mm -hmm. but there was kind of an ugly little brother to the octo finissimo yeah and that was the octo romo that was the watch that you see come in way cheaper, and you're like, ah, well, it's not, okay. I, it, it's a different watch, but that's not the one I want. I want the Finissimo. It kind of, it looks like the Finissimo, but it lacks all of the fine finishing and touches. It looks like if you took the Finissimo and, like, the square shape of it, you could, like, break off, like a piece of chocolate. You, like, you could break around the mold. Yes, you know what I mean? exactly. So, so the Octo Roma kind of had a weird place in, in the collection. You know, more affordable. Especially but, on the secondary market. But not as good, not yeah. as good, and too close, okay? Yeah. Now, that all changed. Mm. Bulgari introduced two Octo Romas this year that just absolutely blew my mind. And I'll, and I'll tell you the, the headline, yep. this is independent watchmaking from a massive brand. Wow. These are probably, I would, I, I, this is dramatic. Yep. These may be two of the greatest watches the brand has ever made in their history. Wow. Not that Bulgari is this like historical, yeah, course, but they've been manufacturing watches for decades. Uh, and these are maybe two of the greatest watches, including Octo Finissimos. And it's interesting because it's still got that DNA, but they clearly were like, well, this has to be a separate watch. Like you could see the, you could see what it usually looks like next to the Finissimo. And then you see what they thought of. Like, Com okay, let's differentiate. Completely. Yeah. Clearly, the Octo Roma case is still intact. They kept that Octo Roma design, which is very similar to the Finissimo, but um, obviously a little bit thicker, a little bit more circular. But they got rid of the bracelet. Yep. And they, for the first time, introduced a rubber strap um, with a really nice textile finish, but a rubber strap on these Octo Romas. For the first time there or for the first time or for the first time ever for, they've, they've never they've never put rubber strap on their octo romas so mm. this was it really made these watches individual yeah. i could see them releasing this watch now these are two tourbillons we'll talk about them in a second sure. but i could see them releasing these watches in a more you know uh, uh less complicated fashion okay but like maybe bare bones just you know quote unquote bare bones sure skeleton no complication Okay, even though skeleton is almost a complication in of itself, but yeah. skeleton, no complication, and this is not an Octo Finissimo ripoff anymore. It's yeah. no longer the cheaper Finissimo. It's not like you're looking at the Finissimo and the Roma together. It's like, okay, well, this is a different watch. I, I don't have to decide if I want the watch to be square or not. Right. It's decidedly different. It's decidedly different. Yep. Um, and it's more individual and it's more characteristic. It's great. Yeah. Let's get into the watches themselves. Both of these watches are Trobillons. Yeah, they're glowing from here already. Both of these watches have this incredible uh, uh, luminescence, mm -hmm. this bright green, not only on the bridges, the dial, um, but also on the straps. The, the stitching is also under UV light iridescent. Yeah. Um, these watches are, uh, these watches have sapphire crystals and case backs, obviously, yeah. but also sapphire middle cases as well. Like sapphire discs, like the mystery yeah. watches? Mystery yeah, all, all, but oh. on, on the sides of the watches. So the side of the case is also sapphire. Oh, the side. Incredibly cool. Wow. Um, this, is, this is super complicated uh, to do. Yeah. It, it was absolutely stunning. These watches are 44 millimeters, which is a large watch, but yeah. I promise you, take my word for it, they are, because the lugs are so compact, yeah. they wear incredibly well. Wow. Um, they wear incredibly well. I think they actually, call me crazy, wear better than the Octo Finissimo. Now, I love the Octo Finissimo, right. but explain that. Octo Finissimo, obviously, the actual watch head is very large, but the bracelet, since it's a square watch, is also massive and doesn't have an aggressive taper. It does have a taper, but it wears on your watch essentially like you're wearing a cuff because of that lack. And that design is intentional. It's part of its beauty. There's no doubt. But it does wear very large. Yes. Okay? Yes. These watches, even at 44, I think wear smaller or, or in that wow. same world, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think actually smaller. I really would say smaller. Wow. Yeah, wow. it's wild. Yeah, uh, they're both Trubillons. Uh Though they're both, I mean, they're to varying degrees, but they're both considered skeleton watches. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the the the, you know, the skeleton that we're seeing right here um, is far more obvious. There's a lot of exposure, yeah. and everything is super finely finished. Everything is just really, really lovely. And the movement is the indices. The movement is the indices, right? Well, well, the, well, the, cool. well the indices are the indices uh, are the movement. Well, well, well the, well, the yeah, the indices. Well, well, the indices are, you know, the the bridges, right, holding yeah, exactly, everything together. Exactly. Obviously, you've got two hands here, um, but they are, you know, obviously integral part of, parts of these watches, and it's so finely finished. 
taking it to the next step, this next tourbillon is truly mind blowing. Wow. This is okay. nuts. Yeah. Okay. It is a tourbillon. Yes. It is a jump hour. And obviously this bottom disc over here is the full 60 minutes. And there are two hands wow. that, that alternate in which one is telling the time. So it goes straight from 60 to zero. Cool. Really it doesn't beautiful. jump there though. It switches. It doesn't hands. because this one, see this one that's that's running horizontally? Yeah. This tucks and that comes out. Whoa. Right? So it's just a really brilliant watch. Um, the execution is, is, I would basically say, flawless. Yeah. Stunning piece. I love the luminescence. I love everything about it. This has very independent spirit. Both 100%. of these watches do. Oh, yeah. This reminds me of like Urwerk. Yeah, I can see that 100%. Especially this one, especially with the center. Totally. Hands coming out like that. Yeah. When, when do we see something like this, something so independent? And it's interesting because that is really. Unexpectedly, I feel like for a while, that is kind of what's shaping up to be Bulgari's edge. The Octofinissimo was the same thing where you're like, what is that? That is crazy. Exactly. The level of watchmaking here is extremely impressive. People aren't really talking about it so much. I think they will at some point. Yeah. These watches will get the credit they deserve. The Erwerk crowd will talk about it. The, the yeah. RM crowd will talk about it. 100%. Where you're just like, whoa, that's, that's actually cool. And this yes. and that. Yeah. 100%. Um, now... It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's amazing that yeah. it's another hit for LVMH. We, we talked about in our last episode the, the you know, an impressive Zenith. Yep. Zenith as a brand is very impressive. We talked about an impressive uh, Carrera. Okay. Yep. And this is another one. LVMH is doing a wonderful job uh, with watchmaking. LVMH is showing a conglomerate understanding of watchmaking. They're doing This it. brand, you get this, this brand, you get that. It has to be to this level, to this level. And it seems boutique-y. Yeah. It, on this level, yeah, specifically. Yeah, this course. seems boutique-y. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, it was incredible. The people at Bulgari were, were amazing. It was, it, was, it was awesome to meet them uh, because they clearly are taking watchmaking so seriously. Exactly. And the people that you spoke to were incredibly, not at Watches and Wonders, you're going to see the incredibly knowledgeable people, but it was evident that they had every single thing down. Oh, absolutely. That's absolutely. Crazy. And I think these watches will be, will be gettable. I think they'll fly under the radar. Yep. Um, they'll fly under the radar, and I think that they will be gettable. I know that sounds, you know, crazy today to even have to say that. Of course. But I think it's interesting. Do you know a price? Um, I don't recall the price. I have to, I have to be honest. Uh, they're over $100,000. They're yeah, both Tourbillons. Yep. They're Sapphire cases. They, you know, Sapphire you know, sandwich case. The watch sounds nuts. It does. I know that. Yeah. But to say it represents value at $130,000, I don't... But but if you look at the other watches in the price point, yeah. I've got to say that they are... <laughs> They are competitive. Wow. They are competitive. That's crazy. Yep. And I think it's it's just a home run. Yeah. It's just going to be a matter of getting people comfortable with giving $100,000 mm -hmm. to Bulgari for which a watch. Is, which I would say was also tough before the Finissimo. It was like, oh, well, was you, it? you guys make the aluminum watch. That's pretty cool. But like, that's a $2,000, $3,000 watch. 100%. Yeah. Before the Octo Finissimo, who was giving Bulgari $30,000? Oh, well... Women that like the serpent things, right? Right, and, and let me tell you again. I don't want to go off too far here, but oh, is that watch even released? No, it's not. Never mind. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Never mind. Sorry. Rob, Christian sorry. showed me some crazy things today. Yeah, yeah. I will. I, yeah, I will, we'll we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it more. Yeah. Um. Uh. So that is phenomenal stuff. I was blown away by Bulgari. Um. Yeah. Major major props. This video is brought to you by Squarespace. Do you have a website or domain, or do you have two? I have two. Wow. Um, but once upon a time ago, when I was a young entrepreneur, yep. I had absolutely no budget for web development and no technical ability of my own. I, I, I really mean it, guys. Right? All my money yep. I put into inventory and all of my skills, I, of which I none I had, yep. uh, I just couldn't build a website. You put them in the inventory. Exactly. I actually uh, tried out a Squarespace competitor first, yep. and I was like having a panic attack because it was horrible. Yep. I was, it was really, really bad. Yep. Uh, trying to build the Theo and Harris company, right? And I was like, oh my God, this is not working clearly. Yeah, I need step to, one, I can't do. I need to raise $10,000 to hire a web developer. I'm in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm screwed. <laughs> okay. Then someone recommended, hey, trial Squarespace. This is going back eight years ago now. Yeah. Right? yeah. And I was like, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll take a shot, right? Is it different than the other one? Worth it. Trust me. I say, great. I did it. It was phenomenal. And the Squarespace is not only easy to use to design through their templates, mm -hmm. uh, functional, setting up shopping, everything was incredibly easy. But the product, no matter what you clicked on, ultimately ended up beautiful. Yeah. Their templates are so 
Regal is the wrong word, but so professional, so clean, so rich. From day one, my company looked like it was a funded company. Pick your designs, pick your style, pick your fonts and stuff like that. Or we will do the entire package for you. Oh, 100%. And it looks good, as in you said it works, as in how it looks. It's also the site just works, the which site is huge. And if you want to change something in a year or two, you don't have to redesign the entire website. You 100%. can look at a different theme, snap it in. Exactly. So I could not recommend Squarespace enough to people that are just starting their company. Yep. But even more than that, guys, if you own a company and have a website, the odds are it's it's not what it could be. And when it comes to business, it always should be what it could be. Yeah. So take a look at Squarespace, make an account, and just play around with the templates, okay? Your, your whole world of possibility, what you think, you know, is 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 almost limitless, right? It's amazing what Squarespace can do for you. How they can improve your company, give it a professional, clean, beautiful look that is going to whether it's inspire people to contact you or spend money in your store or or come visit your shop or whatever it might be. Take a look at your resume, whatever it is. Um, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. What you're saying is what you thought it should be and would could be if it should be so good to be good. Could hey, be that, my words held logic. You really, no, you just, the way you said it was perfect. Yeah. I was like, wow, he's going to start it's, rapping. He's a natural born marketer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's it. So thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Yes, and if you are interested in getting a website or domain, you can use our code Theo Harris to save 10% off of your first order of a website or domain. And I highly recommend you do. Yes. Next collection here. Yeah, this is this is less about the watch and more about the collection and the trajectory of the brand, right? Piaget. No, talk to me about what what are you thinking? You don't need to make a soliloquy, but what yeah. are you thinking about the brand right now as you see this collection? Well, when I what I think when I see this is the women watches, the women's watches are incredibly loud, incredibly beautiful. I love the thin watch designs from Piaget, and then I see the polo and I'm like, yeah, you really you really kind of bet the farm on the polo being your watch. That's my main thought. And some some of them I think are beautiful, but I'm like, yeah, you, you want me to buy a polo. Yes. Yeah. And what is the polo? To talk about it from a, uh, from a marketing level, right? What is the polo? What does the polo stand for? What does it stand for? And we're talking only modern How polo. about this? What does an original polo stand okay, for? Okay, see, that's the big question. It's a good question. The original polo stands for being loud, ostentatious. I'm decidedly telling you that I have money. I'm wearing a heavy bracelet of gold that is beautifully designed. And it's decidedly loud. What does a what does a Patek Philippe Calatrava represent? I have money, but I don't really want to discuss it. This is my subtle watch. I go to the opera and I sit very calmly, and that's it. What does the modern day Piaget Polo represent? Uh, I love to jump across buildings and play sports. It, even if that. Even if I'm just I'm referencing that ad. Oh, you know that right, ad? right. The guy but, but, I forget who Ryan Reynolds is like jumping, jumping across buildings. buildings. Yeah, but yeah. really, what does it represent? The answer is more no. obvious than that. What's, what's the obvious answer? The obvious answer is nothing. Or, or I guess, if on a watch perspective, the obvious answer is it's not the Royal Oak, it's not the Paddock, it's, it's the PJ. I, I wanted an Aquanaut, but I couldn't get one. Exactly, yeah. You know, or there, or something like a Royal Oak. That's it. Yeah. That's not strong brand identity. Right. That's very weak. Right. Now. The old identity. Oh, you, you said it perfectly. Yeah. And, and you were able, and, and I think the PJ people would be able to tell you exactly what that old polar represented. Yeah. Because it represented something. Yep. This polo does not represent something. Mm -hmm. It represents nothing. Yes. That being said, let's look at the watch for its merits. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that the Piaget polo on the rubber strap in, well, in this particular scenario, it's in black. In the Aquanaut but I think configuration. That in the Aquanaut configuration is an awesome watch. Yeah. I think if you do this with a cool dial and you do this uh, on different colors, I wouldn't do black on black. Like black on black is not what I would pride myself on because it's so much of an Aquanaut that it's It's awkward. not what you go to Piaget for. Exactly. Yeah. But at $11,600, I got to say... It is phenomenal. So an Aquanaut right now is $25,000 and the Piaget is eleven six. okay? So it's under half the price. And I think wow. that it is on par with the quality of watch. Available? Available. Available. So there's a great argument to buy certain Piaget polos. Sure. Now, you know, the Piaget polo on the bracelet as a paddock Nautilus alternative, it misses because the bracelet is subpar. But right. on the leather, on the rubber right. straps, they're not. Especially the skeleton ones. The skeleton ones are incredibly cool. Yeah. There is definitely, it sounds crazy, but there's value in the Piaget polo line. Yeah. 
and it could be their mass market heavy hitter. Yeah. It could be a great success. That's the you goal. You do it in it. fun colors. You do it, and it's cool, and it's great. Right. Uh, and it, it, it kind of takes away from the, the Aquanaut alternative. Like, you can, you can make mm. it. The addition of colors makes it, it's still an Aquanaut, but it's something that Aquanaut won't do. Exactly. Unless you do dark green. Or something. Exactly. There, there's something to be worked with there. Yeah. That being said, it still doesn't represent all that much. Mm. Okay? Yep. One step up, the perpetual calendar. At $76,000, a rose gold, ultra thin, perpetual calendar Piaget is a phenomenal, phenomenal watch. This is a home run watch. Yep. I would recommend this watch to almost anyone. Especially on rubber. Looks cool on, on rubber. rubber. Did you see it on uh, Exotic, on the strap? I did not. I saw it on rubber. The integrated rubber look? Killer. It's a buy. Yeah. It still doesn't represent anything. Of course. And, and that's not, guys, this is not just Christian being, you know, sour on Piaget. I love Piaget. Piaget is wondering where they're headed. Really? Yes. It was awesome speaking with them and listening to them because they're they're really working hard to deliver value to the audience. Sure. They want more than anything else to be loved by the watch community. Okay, Piaget cares. Okay, mm. Piaget has had massive success. They've experienced massive success. Yep, multiple times. Mm. Most brands never get that. Right. I mean, most brands in any category, watches are, they've experienced wild, raging success on multiple occasions. Sure. And they're just looking for it again. Okay. Wow. Which, those occasions being the Polo, the original Polo. The original Polo. In the mid-2000s, they had some models that were just really? raging okay. success. You couldn't hold them. They were just printing really? money for the brand. Wow. What printing models are those, money. You know? I forget, but they were mentioning them. It's just not my era of, oh, of watch, okay. gotcha. you know? Yeah. But, um, but yes, can they do it again? Mm. And my answer to the question is, you've got some great stuff here. Yeah. Some great stuff. Yeah. This is not your brand identity. Yeah. You, you don't you, actually have one yet. You can do it again, but you're betting on it being the polo. And it's not, and the I don't think it's going out. to be. Polo's been here. Exactly. Right. The polo is a great alternative to, uh, uh, it, the, polo, the polo is a phenomenal solution to, to a market demand, which mm. is the Aquanaut. Yes. It's a great solution. People yeah. love a luxury uh, uh, sports watch on a rubber strap. Yeah, it's great Who watch. doesn't love it? The Oyster Flex, all these different brands. It's yep. amazing stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and that's a great solution. But that cannot be your brand identity. Because mm. it isn't a brand identity. Right. Okay. Yeah. They've got to reestablish themselves with something. Mm. Okay. Uh, we can talk about what that is down the road. We can discuss that at, at greater length. But they need something. Because I would also say thinness is kind of an identity they imposed on themselves, but not an identity that the rest of the world was like, well, yeah, that's what I want. And thinness is always going to be, you know, it's always going to be a little bit polarizing. Like, sure. you know, it's kind of, it's not as mass market. Right. You know, they want something that the people want. Right. You know, and so it's going to be hard. Like, they're not, they can't just bet dress. Yep. They need to design something completely original that reflects Piaget messaging, which what you said before was just decadence, yep. but in the 21st century. Mm. And it's not the pole. They also have, they have so much stuff to set them up for. They have the history of great watches, history of great movements that mm -hmm. some of the highest brands in the world have been after, and the smallest note, but also the biggest note, an incredibly cool looking logo. Oh my the God. The text of Piaget is fantastic. Not to mention, how many brands can say that their brand name has such perceived value? Yeah. Exactly. Piaget watches have, the name is, yeah. oh, that's that's a really expensive watch. Oh, yeah, you yeah. You can't get and, that. Oh, even, like my, even in the watch nerdy part, like, well, my Cartier has a Piaget movement. Right. It's like, oh, that's sick. That's, that's sick. cool. Yeah. Exactly. A large portion of the populace understands that Piaget has real has a real name to it, real regal, real yeah. expensive. Brands would kill for that reputation. Yeah. Brands would kill for it. So so that's Piaget, that's the status. There are, some of these watches are awesome, particularly perpetual. The, also the, the 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 polo on a rubber band. I love this <laughs> rubber stuff. Strap. Rubber strap. I love this stuff, but but it's not it's not the future. Right. It's this mm -hmm. plus probably an original polo reissue. Yep. Plus something else. Yeah. What's the next thing? And they're trying to figure out. I promise you they're trying. Wow. It's really fascinating. Yeah. This is a brand to watch. Not maybe to buy for you yet. Consider it. They're great. Sure. But it's a brand to watch. 
It's a brand on, on, on the rise. Social that would have been a great name if Theo and Harris didn't take off. What? A brand to watch. Straps, um, as many of you should know, bring a whole world of potential to mix up your watch collection. They breathe new life into watches. They help you pull out different colors. They, they give them new personality. Straps can be uh, very addictive. I know people with two watches and 10 straps because it adds so many facets to a collection in a, in a fairly you know, easy and fun way. So that's why they become such a part of the Theo and Harris you know, culture and identity. I think we sell more exotic straps than, than almost anybody because I just love them so much and I love sharing them with you. your thoughts on the Tank Normal? Beautiful watch, an immediate buy from me. I said it in the video too, I wish they had the older Breguet hands. That yes. to me would have been a full on knockout, but I look at that in platinum and I'm like, oh, if only you made that in steel in a run of, I don't know, if you didn't make it a limited run, that would be such an amazing watch. If only you made it in steel. Yeah. Unfortunately, the reality is if they did make it in steel, it would actually be more expensive, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, exactly. and you certainly couldn't get it. Right. Um, these are great watches. I do think that the silver dial falls a little bit flat on the platinum. Oh, it's silver. It's, it's not silver. white. It's silver. I don't love it. Yeah. That aside, it's a great reissue. They did an amazing job. The bracelets. Are, the bracelets are a thing of art. It's a thing of art. Yeah. But only a hundred each. Now, why a hundred each? You tell me. That's Cartier. Well, it's, it is it is Cartier's, uh, what is it, CPP, CCPC something, mm. where they're re-releasing the- Collection Privé. Collection Privé. Mm -hmm. And the point of that is to go back to Cartier's old way of making watches, which was not mass market. It was, these are the tank, for example. Mm -hmm. We made 50 this mm -hmm. year, and that's it, because we're the jeweler of kings. We don't make mass market. And then they went mass market, and everything was coming out quick, and essentially Cartier became like women's quartz watches. Mm -hmm. And this is, they're not that anymore, of course, but this is, they're like, no, we still are Cartier. Right. But we also do this too. 100%. They don't want, they don't want it to become too available. Yep. I understand that. This is supposed to be the royalty level of Cartier watches. But couldn't they make 300? <laughs> yeah, couldn't they make just enough for the people that really want You know, want? I feel like 300... 600 watches, you know, 300 each, there are 600 in total. Yeah. I don't know, I feel like that would have been a little bit better, I do I do think. It still would be unattainable to the masses. Yeah, of course. But it would, because how do you break up 300 watches? Or how do you break up 600 watches, right? Sure. You say, okay, we're gonna allocate 400 of the 600 to our greatest clients, sure. right? To the clients that, that they spend so much money with us that they deserve it. Mm -hmm. And then the other 200, you use your you use your, your, I would almost just call it CRM programs, but you use your, your almost social teams, your, yeah, kind of like social media and, 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 and CRM programs to say. You use the guys that who, watch YouTube channels. Who, who deserves this watch? Right. Who, if I give this watch to, obviously you have to buy it, yeah, is going to just crap their pants. Yeah. You know, and just feel like the luckiest person in the world and so grateful. Right. Because the brand doing that is a show of gratitude. Of course. Not just giving it to the rich people, but or, uh, listen, if you're buying a watch for $70,000, you're doing just fine. But of course. not <laughs> yeah. just giving it to the people that are spending millions on jewelry, sure. but to giving it on the people to the people that say, wow, I've been waiting for this for forever. forever. Yeah. I, yeah. I thought I would never get this watch or see this watch in my lifetime. Yes. Yeah. And, and the reason why I, it's clear that Cartier is trying to do that to some degree mm. is with their, you know, their, their, well, two things. A, Cartier is making it more attainable, still very difficult, to get a custom watch made. Yes. You've seen that yep. all over Instagram. Yep. And second, Cartier is connecting with this or building this Cartier watch community Instagram page, which is wow. dedicated all to their, basically their real Cartier watch lovers. Like if you know, you really are into the Cartier watch brand. Wow. You you, you know, this is their effort. Okay? This is okay. Kind of like a collection privé level of of love. Yeah. You're not you're not buying a Ballon Blue. Right. You know, you're buying a, a you know about car you really are a student of the brand. Right. Their content is terrible. Yeah. Sorry to everyone right. involved, Waco, uh, all these people. This is not good content. Um, what is the content? It, there's some videos and they're just not good videos. No. The, you know what's funny? The photos are great. Yeah. 
and the videos are terrible. That, it's hysterical. Yeah. It, the videos are uncartier. The videos are not consistent with the brand. Wow. So that's okay. bad. Yeah, that is bad. But it's really nice that Cartier is saying, yeah, we need to build a community. Yeah, right. Because we've got this huge mass market community. Of course. But what about the club of people that truly love this brand? Right. What about you know? the, the reason that we actually brought back Cartier Privé? Exactly. What about those people? Exactly. Because those people are not a, 200 people. Right. 200 people spend a ton of money at Cartier. Right. But those 200 people may not even be in the same ballpark. Right. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Not saying that you can't afford one, of right. course. Right. No, no. Like, I couldn't possibly afford it, right? A guy you need to be on... buying a million dollars in jewelry every, you know, a couple of years. or almost, I mean, listen, I know people that have spent a million dollars in, in Cartier or, or Bulgari jewelry in a year to get an allocation from an AD. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I know people that have spent half a million, but yeah. it's still a ton of money. Like, oh, my God. You know, yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe, sure. Could, could you swing a watch for, you know, 80? Sure. Can you swing the 780 to get the allocation for the watch that's 80? These are two different leagues of people. Oh, yeah. Um, both oh, in yeah. Fi- financially and in what you, what you can even stomach. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. that's really specific. So, so anyway, that's why I think that Cartier is headed in the direction mm. of building community, allocating watches to the people that really, really love them, not just the people that are spending tr- huge money. Right. It's just in the infancy. It's still yeah, pretty yeah. young. This effort is young. Right. Well, it's also, I bet they're like, let's see, let's see what this does. What does this do when we're, when we're doing this? Do people actually care? Or is it going to be like, this Instagram gets 100,000, or not even 100,000, gets 1,000 followers. People are like, oh, I hope I get one. Yeah. You know? But, but how, how is it going to succeed if you do better content? If you do better, well... If you do better content and you have enough, there's enough sense that like, okay, if, I, if I'm following this, it may not be five years, but like, I'll get one eventually. Right. Because I see a hundred release in, in two different medals and I'm like, no, I will never see one or get one. It becomes... It's play. It's not even encouraging. It's a photo. I'm like, yeah. that, that's a beautiful looking photo. Exactly. That's all it is. Um, exa- exactly right. Yeah. The next watch I want to discuss, and I, I want to talk about indoctrinating new watch people after this episode. Okay. okay a little, yep. little discussion there. Um, but this is their normal skeleton. With and the, this was, this is a far more impressive release than the normal. This is the 24 hour movement. This is the 24 hour movement. Okay. Uh, with day and night. Yeah. Sun, moon. Yeah. This is, I would say, Cartier has done amazing jobs with their skeletons before. Yep. Amazing, right? Their uh, Louis Cartier is phenomenal. Uh, a little bit large, but phenomenal. Yep. Their Santoses are great. Um, they've done a lot of really great skeletons. This is the best one ever. You've seen this in the metal? No. Oh. Really? Oh, Not even I saw it in yellow. You saw I didn't it in see yellow? it in white. Wow. I didn't see it in platinum. Okay, okay. Yes. Um, this is unbelievable. Yeah. Truly. This is art. Yeah. yeah, it's you know it's it's interesting because I feel like part of the art with Cartier is also seeing when they respect their or come close to respecting their old case size. Mm-hmm. You're like, wow, like, you know, in, in this picture, it's huge. It takes up your laptop, but when you see it this big, yes. you're like, wow, it's that's a little bit incredible. larger than the originals, but it's exactly. still very vintage. Yeah, exactly. And that's when you're like, oh, like when I got my Zenith uh, El Premier, or when I got my Zenith Shadow. It was cool online. I really wanted it. And then I saw that it was small. And I was like, oh, yeah. That's it. There's, there's something special when something's compact enough. Totally. Just for a second to wax poetic a little bit about, about this watch. Sure. Um, look at the sun. Look at the moon. Look at the gradation of color along the outer track. Look at everything. Mm-hmm. Not only is this watch, again, back on my love for skeletons. Sure. Skeleton watches need to be so finely finished that... You're basically being looked at naked, yeah. right? And and I don't know about you, but I'm far better in a sweater, right? Like, yeah, I'm yeah. far better with the dial on. No, you people know? love sweaters, yeah. You know, uh, uh, now, skeleton watches, you can't hide behind anything. Everything needs to be just beautiful. Otherwise, it's very underwhelming. Yes. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and you shouldn't be doing... At that point, not that you shouldn't be doing, but at that point, skeleton is a uh, fun fact more than it is art. Yeah. Not only does Cartier finish everything superbly. Of course. Cartier introduces, to, like, theory. Yes. Cartier is introducing an idea into their construction. They're telling a, it's not telling a story, but it's kind yeah. of telling a story. It's well, it's like Bulgari's new Roma. They're like, well, the movement is the indices. Right. And it's like, oh, that's very cool. This is like, well, you see the sun, right? And you see right. the moon. Like that's, this is that's the next different. level. Right. This is the next level. You know, um, it's absolutely stunning. It's, it's not even obvious enough to be distracting or ugly. Yeah, of course. It's so good. Um, it's true. This is truly 
one of the greatest watches, not just of 2023, of the last five years, maybe more. This this might be the greatest Cartier release um, of the last 10 years. I don't know of wow. a better. I mean, the only one that competes with this, in my view, would be the uh, Skeleton Crash. But even the Skeleton Crash didn't have refined. the level of theory as this does. Yeah. Wow. This is probably the greatest Cartier, like modern Cartier. And can you imagine seeing someone wearing that? You're at the diner. You're like, whoa, wait a minute. Can't even. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah it's, the, it's it's truly the greatest watch. And again, I think that the I think the 25 or whatever it is 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 not enough. Um, I don't. Think 25 it, allocation or 25. Yeah, being made. I don't think it's enough. It's yeah, but it is. It's exactly what the collection says it is. It's how we used to do things. Yeah. Which is like, oh, cool. But also like, well, maybe since you don't do things that way anymore, like you can modify it a little bit. Right. Yeah. But um, but just stunning. And, and I was just I was just blown away by this watch. Yeah. True. So yeah, I, I guess. Just moving on, um, just I guess it's one thing I wanted to talk about was um, was did you see Hodinky release the Kermit the Frog uh, epi- uh, episode? I didn't see the episode. Okay. I saw that they released it. I saw the little Instagram teaser. Okay, um, Hodinky released uh, Ben Clymer released a talking watches with Kermit the Frog um, this past week. Yeah, um, number one. Was it an Oris thing? It started. Yes. Okay. Well, this is actually a pretty great conversation. Okay, number one. Um, Oris, I didn't really get the Kermit the Frog thing. Yeah, um, I didn't really get it. I mm-hmm. saw the watch. I think the dial is cool. It doesn't. I mean, it's not. It's not obviously Kermit. The Kermit's only on one date. I think like the it, first it, or the thirty first. Yeah, it's yeah. not a big deal. Like it's 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 fine. I mean, I probably wouldn't buy. It. I think that the case it's in, the Pro Pilot case, is the best. I also think they they also did the um, five day movement. Yeah. Well, correct me if I'm wrong on the on the movement date, but they that movement is crazy beautiful. So I think that watch is amazing. I think it represents value under five thousand dollars, forty six hundred dollars. I think it's cool. The lime green, whatever, it's fun. I think the Oris Kermit is cool. Killer. I don't particularly care about the Kermit collab. It, that doesn't really mean anything to me. Yeah. But I think it's cool. They did this piece of content with Hodinky in collaboration. Mm-hmm. Um, it's some sort of sponsored content, obviously, right? Or there had to be some sort of financial arrangement, otherwise, you know. Otherwise, that'd be just so weird. It'd be bizarre. <laughs> right? Ben's like, oh, I have an idea. Yeah, right. But it gave the entire Oris release, and even more so the Hodinky idea, so much more meaning. Mm. Okay. Um, rewinding a little bit. I say that the greatest, one of the greatest moments, if not the greatest moment in watch content was Talking Watches 1 with John Mayer. Yeah. That indoctrinated, evangelized a whole new generation of watch geeks, myself being one of them. Like, I will always owe Hodinkee. Forget about my business. Like, my love for watches in so many ways. Sure. Like, so so much so. That yeah. was such a legitimizing thing. It brought everyone in. Hodinkee, Ben says he didn't even know how big it was going to be, you know, you know, but it was genius. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, and in retrospect, it wasn't that genius. You're interviewing John Mayer about watches. It's not that genius. Yeah, right. But it worked so well. It's it, well, John Mayer also, the way he spoke about things, you're like, oh, it's kind of funny. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, I understand. Yes. Yeah. It, it, plus, it's John Mayer, so it's incredibly cool and it's it's approachable, whatever. Kermit mm. is the second best talking, or second most important talking watches host ever. Wow. 100%. You know he's not. You know it's not actually a frog, yeah, right? And I'll tell you why. Yeah. Because for the first time since the John Mayer talking watches, Hodinkee has done a really good job at introducing watches to a whole new world of people. Wow. Right? Kids. Yeah. Like, wow. In, it's kid focused? Well, I mean, anyone would watch it. You would watch it. I would watch it. A bunch yeah, of grown yeah, men yeah. are going to watch it. Oh, I meant, I mean, was the content very kid focused? It's introduction into watches. Oh, wow. Yeah, and, and they didn't just show Oris. Like, they showed the Oris Kermit. They also showed an Omega. They showed other watches. They talked about watches. Interesting. Watch movements, all that stuff. Wow. It was the most intelligent piece of watch content I have 100% seen. Watches for kids. Watches for kids. Wow. You, Who's not going to show that to their kids? Do you think it's moving into a child release? I, I do, think a birth. Yeah. Well, it's funny because Ben's a dad. Yeah. And I I, I never say, oh, only XYZ could have thought of that. Only only, oh, yeah, sure. only yeah, someone yeah. who's a father. Only so- Come on. But it was a great idea. It makes sense that it was from a father. Yeah, of course. And Ben's 
giddiness through the episode. I, I don't love Ben on camera because he's always, he's not always, he's often very reserved and almost holding back his interest, trying to kind of stay stoic, a little bit friendly, but pretty much stoic. Yeah. And yet here he was just so happy. He was really? an unbelievable sport. Like, it was awesome. It wow. was absolutely awesome. I sent it to a whole bunch of people that I know. Like, show this to your kids. Wow. This is this is, this is is Watches. Welcome to Watches. Yeah. Your kid doesn't know who John Mayer is yet. Right. Welcome to Watches. Wow. Interesting. Exactly. And so uh, the joke, obviously, I made was the, the, the child thing. But do you think this is to lead into, and not even in like a, a aggressive way or anything, a... Kids Watch release from Hodinkee or a Kids Watch release from well, any of these brands. Well, there already is, right? Hodinkee is Parchi Pal. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Like Parchi Pal is the is the Hodinkee flick flack. Yeah, you know. So there right. already is a Kids Watch. They didn't really integrate it. I I, I don't think they did. Uh, but they could in the in the future more. I mean, but Parchi Pal and I you know it would you know whatever take it. I mean, you're already thinking this, whatever, Ben. Yeah. But Parchi Pal talking watches hosted by Ben. Would be the best. Of that would be the greatest piece of marketing Parchi Pal could ever have. Oh yeah. Um, everyone would watch it. Everyone would show their kids. Everyone would buy a Parchi Pal. Um, period end. Like, 100%. Like, like, period, like period end. Yeah. End of conversation. Um, Parchi Pal would be a better partner than Oris. Of course. Right. Yeah. Like like. No, well, that's why my question was: Is Oris and Hodinkee being like, let's release a kids watch? No. But why, why release it with them when I just own my own? Well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So that's what, that's what it, I, I was wondering if it was like from the perspective of like, oh yeah, of course we'll do an integration with Kermit and also we can, we can start like building something else up. 100%. Or if it was Oris also being like, build this up. 100%. Yeah. 100%. How do we, how do we grab kids' attention really young, lay the foundation and then own their attention into their adolescence and everything like that? Yeah. Um, oh, that, wow. that, 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 that content strategy is worth a ton of money. Like I'm sure Ben's already doing it. He's a very smart guy. Yeah. But this was the best. Wow. I love the other talking watches. I love Goldberger, I love all that stuff. This was it. Mic wow. drop. This was it. Well, wow. does Kermit yeah. have a good collection? It wasn't about Kermit's collection. Oh. It, it was like it was like Kermit and Ben interacting on education about watches. See, my idea would have killed. It was Kermit's collection. Kermit's pulling out perpetual paddocks and everything. <laughs> and he's like, I've been in showbiz for years. And then it's April Fool's. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, but yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I wonder who else they're going to do. I mean, the like the, the move would be that you can introduce new characters. You can make your own. You can make your own characters. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, interesting. That's what you do. That's the move. Would you say, did Kermit make it work? Or could it be any, any character? J just like Talking Watches. John Mayer gets you to care, then you introduce a bunch of people you never heard about. Mm. Goldberger doesn't matter without Mayer. Right. Right? Meaning yeah, to yeah, the yeah. masses. Of course. Yeah. Once I indoctrinated all of you into watches, now I can show you some, some stuff you didn't know about. Now mm. I can show you uh, some obscure guy you otherwise wouldn't have clicked on. Interesting. Right? Get yeah. guys like Kermit and all these other characters promoting it. Make them around. Introduce new new your new new characters, your own characters, fun characters, and that's it. And it's a whole children's show. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's okay, it. Talk about great job, Hodinky. Talk about LVMH knowing how to set up an entire ladder of fires. <laughs> Unbelievable. Oh my! No, seriously, I know. I know. Your education starts at kids, and then it's like, okay, well, you have this, and you're on Hodinky. So now. Look at the Zenith and this Bulgari and 100%. this, this, and this, this, and it's just 100%. like, that's crazy. 100%. A lot of different, you know, creative, like creative entertainment is popping up all over. Like sure. a bunch of big companies are releasing their own children's content because there's a, de there's a desire, right? Like a lot of parents don't want to, like a lot of parents are being selective because yeah, there's so much weird stuff out there that they're saying, okay, let me, let me show them this content that I know is clean. Right. Like right. with no agenda. Yeah. So the agenda here is buy watches when you can afford them. Can That's get more pretty insane. harmless. Yeah, right. You know? Exactly. Um, it's very profitable, but it's pretty harmless. The next one's terrible. It's super yeah. gendered. We're like, oh my uh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so he's gonna stop this. yeah so anyway that's that's it thank you guys for watching uh thanks for your time michael you're welcome and, thank you uh, head on over to theo and harris watch shop and and take a look at the vintage rolexes we have in in stock and go ahead and pick up a strap in the theo and harris leather strap shop they're all handmade and they're absolutely lovely get a wallet yeah we have the fulton wallets too that's i've been right. looking into saffiano leather uh -huh. is that what it's called yeah yeah, yeah. that was like cool. nice stuff yeah yeah totally anyway that's it guys thanks so much